Pardon me, friend. Have you been drinking alcohol? Well, if this is the case, then that's completely fine. If you're in the United States, you're of the right age and you're not, you know, operating heavy machinery or at work. Welcome to Stuff They Don't Want You To Know. This week, Scully, Matt and I are looking at prohibition because, as you probably know, if you look at the history of the United States, alcohol was not always legal. In 1919, Congress ratified the 18th Amendment banning the manufacture, transit, and importation of alcohol, and this went into effect in 1920. The United States was theoretically a completely dry country. Advocates of this plan saw alcohol as a moral threat, and without the crippling abuses of this demon drink, there's no telling what this great nation could do. They predicted that without alcohol, you know, flooding the streets, that crime would go down. They predicted that the public health would be better and the moral character, whatever that was supposed to mean at the time. We know, of course, that Congress agreed, right, and they passed the amendment, and we know that in 1933, Congress and most of the nation decided they were wrong, and alcohol was legal again and has been ever since. However, this strange experiment in morality and public health uh, didn't disappear in 1933. In fact, prohibition left the United States with several long-term serious effects, which continue in the modern day. Here are three. Number one, prohibition was massively expensive. So expensive. Picture a number in your head. No, more than that. Like pr proportionately more than that. In a day and age where the average Ford factory worker made $5 a day, that was good money back then, prohibition cost $300 million just to enforce. But there were other hidden costs too, aside from you know just the cost of G-men salaries to go and bust bootleggers. And one of those biggest costs was tax revenue. On a national level, the United States lost $11 billion of tax revenue between 1920 and 1933 just because of prohibition. And this has an interesting effect too that I'll get to in a second because the next hidden cost was the thousands of jobs that people lost. Now, advocates of prohibition had painted a somewhat optimistic is literally the nicest word we can use. They had painted an optimistic picture of life in a dry America. And what they said was, well, without people spending all of their money on booze, several things will happen. They said sales of other goods and products will shoot up. So, you know, bubble gum, soda pop, stuff like that. They said that property prices would rise, landlords would make more in rent because bars would close down and the neighborhoods would become safer, more desirable places to live. Funny story, none of that happened. What actually happened was much worse. We mentioned those thousands of people who lost their job. Well, they weren't just brewers. They weren't just distillers. They weren't just guys driving around a booze delivery van or whatever. There were also waiters at restaurants across the nation that closed because without a liquor license, they were not profitable. There were also people who worked in the entertainment industry, movies, live shows, dance clubs, who also closed. And here, is maybe the most immediate way this affects you if you live in the United States today. Because what did states do to make up for all this lost tax revenue in a prohibition world? Income tax, my friend. It's true, prohibition may be one of the reasons that you, depending upon the state in which you live, pay the amount of income tax you do today. But money isn't everything, right? You know, that's the thing people always say is like, oh, at least you have your health, which brings us to number two, public health. Well, as you could see, prohibition was successful in that it reduced drinking rates for people. Not a lot of people are gonna go out and uh, start stumbling through a black market to find one shot of Evan Williams or, or Four Roses or whatever they were drinking at the time. But despite this, people did die from alcohol consumption. Actually, a lot more people died consuming illegal alcohol than would have if prohibition never happened. And maybe they got off lucky because if you didn't die, you still had a chance of being paralyzed or struck blind, which sounds positively biblical, from drinking tainted alcohol because it's not 
like you couldn't find alcohol, you just weren't supposed to find it. Oh, and one other thing, interesting fact, at the end of Prohibition, there were more alcoholics than there were at the beginning of Prohibition. So if we're talking about how to find illegal alcohol, this leads us to number three, and maybe one of the biggest lasting effects of the prohibition policies of the 20s, and that is the rise of organized crime. The Dick Tracy days, you know, the untouchables versus Al Capone, uh, the Kennedy family, allegedly. We have to say allegedly at that part. But the rise of organized crime was unprecedented. Imagine the advocates of uh, fighting this moral panic called alcohol. They said that crime would decrease. But that is the opposite of what happened. Crime increased, including violent crime, because these people found such a lucrative financial opportunity smuggling alcohol, manufacturing alcohol, owning different pharmacies or speakeasies where they could peddle it to the public, and with so much money in play, law enforcement wasn't able to fight it as well as you might think. In fact, law enforcement was often in on the game. Not just local law enforcement, not just the cops. You know, the judges too. Not just the judges, but uh, also, you know, the state legislature members. Well, not just them, but also people in Congress. You see where we're going with this. The massive amounts of money generated by organized crimes, alcohol industry, which if you remember already had a pre-existing infrastructure from back when it was legal, this stuff poured into law enforcement and gave rise to organized corruption. And the fortunes that were made in this trade changed the economic face of the United States. So what we find when we look at prohibition is that in this time, there were so many actual conspiracies, not conspiracy theories, actual groups of people working together in secret to break the law and to make money off of it. And of course, that leads us to one of the most important points for uh, some of you watching today, and that is, did prohibition end? Well, yes, prohibition of alcohol ended, but prohibition as a practice continues today, not just in the United States, but in other countries. Of course, you are probably most familiar with the prohibition of marijuana, which is slowly eroding on a state by state basis. And we have to look back at the historical context here to ask ourselves what lessons learned from prohibition of alcohol uh, can be applied to the prohibition of marijuana. So what do you think about prohibition? Does it work? Does it not work? Uh, were the reasons behind it even salient or valid to begin with? Should the United States make alcohol illegal again? Surprise, some people do think that's the best step to take. But we have one more thing for you coming up at the end of this week. We're going to look at some of the illegal activities that took place during Prohibition. Not by criminals, no. Uh, not by winos, not by hobos, not by closet alcoholics, but by Uncle Sam. Thanks so much for watching. Stay tuned.